For dark themes and other custom colour palettes, it's now possible to change the colour of the path fields above each file display instead of them always being a light colour. This also applies to the search field. Most pop-up menus can now be recolored, and if a dark background colour is used, then Opus will custom draw the entire menu to avoid problems with visual styles which are typically designed for dark on light. When using standard system colours, the visual styles are still used, but as soon as you switch, your toolbars and menus will be drawn differently. The status bar is similar, and you can now use a dark background colour without bright frames and dividers being drawn on top of it. Colours for bar graphs can now be configured separately for files and folders, and you now have control over the border and background colours in addition to the bars themselves. A new option, which didn't quite make 12.10 but will be in the next beta, allows a hybrid of visual styles for the file displays while maintaining control over file selection colours. With this, you won't have to compromise between a modern file display that supports things like hot items under the mouse cursor and being able to see what you have selected if you're using a dark background colour where the system selection colours are quite difficult to see. When you click on a folder tab which is already active, the default action allows you to rename that tab with a name which is then kept even when you change folders. A new preferences option allows you to turn that off, or you can make it so that clicking the active tab will take you back to the tab which was active before it. To demonstrate the next part, I'm opening a huge mess of folder tabs. There are only four unique folders here in total, but two of them are open in multiple tabs. This new command allows you to collapse all open windows and their folder tabs into the window which you run it from, while suppressing duplicate tabs. Normally you'd run this from a button or hotkey, but I haven't set one of those up, so I'm just going to run it from the command bar. Before I run the command, note that each side only has one tab to start with. Running the command closes all the other windows, and the two unique folders which they had open are now displayed in tabs in this window. The empty space on the tab bar can now be clicked to activate that side of the lister without worrying about modifying the file selections. Scroll bars and other elements also work the same. Preferences allows you to choose which edge of the file display folder tabs will appear on, but this setting affects all windows at once, which you may not want. You now have the option of moving the tabs in individual windows using a button or hotkey, and the command to use is set tab position. When you save a layout, Opus will suggest saving over the one which the lister came from, if applicable. The same is now true when saving folder tab groups. The name of the last group which you loaded will be pre-selected and is also highlighted in the drop-down list. A new command also allows you to save over the current tab group in a single click and without prompting. The font size of individual folder tabs is now saved as part of layouts. The font sizes are restored again when you load the layout. When you drag a folder tab from one side to the other, that tab is now automatically activated. A few people have seen performance issues where they had a lot of folder tabs open and also had a lot going on in the background on their machines. If there is too much background activity and too many folder tabs, the tabs may not be able to process file system events as quickly as they are generated, which can cause a backlog. A new preferences option allows inactive folder tabs to go to sleep and not process any file system events until activated. When this option is off, only the active tabs process events. Inactive tabs sleep in the background and will automatically reread their folders if required when you activate them. Left clicking branches of the folder tree normally navigates to them in the active folder tab. You can now change this by binding the mouse button to a different command via preferences. Here, I'm making it so each click opens the folder in a new tab, or switches to an existing tab if one is already open. You can drag elements from the path field to the tab bar to open new tabs for them, and this now also works with drive routes. This also works from the folder tree, file display and so on. Recent updates to Windows 10 changed the way that OneDrive works yet again, so we've updated our side to accommodate. OneDrive will appear in the folder tree if selected in Preferences. 
Alternatively, if you prefer the keyboard, there is a built-in slash OneDrive alias. Aliases are also useful in buttons and hotkeys to avoid tying yourself down to paths which may vary between accounts and machines. When in a OneDrive folder, icons in the status column tell you the state of your files, whether they are online, offline, synchronising and so on. The attributes column will also show O for offline files and P for files which are pinned, which means they are always available locally. Thumbnails are retrieved for files which are in the cloud without having to download the entire files themselves. So these two images do not exist locally yet, but I can see their thumbnails. Opening an image in the viewer will cause the full file to be downloaded automatically. And you can see its status icon has changed, indicating that the local copy is now available. The right-click menu has the same options that Explorer has for pinning files to the local drive or clearing them to save space. You can also make toolbar buttons which do the same thing. These buttons are using the new HIDIF path code, so they only appear when in the OneDrive folder. We'll cover that in more detail later. Within folder formats, a new format exists for the OneDrive folder, primarily so you can automatically add the status column. If the status icons aren't enough on their own, the new Availability column gives you the same information in text format. As an aside, a frequently asked question. If you dislike seeing today, yesterday and day names in the date column for dates within the last week, you can turn that off here. We also support the new version of Dropbox, which is called Dropbox Smart Sync. The new slash Dropbox alias takes you to your Dropbox folder, similar to the OneDrive alias we saw before. As with OneDrive, Dropbox now allows you to have files in the cloud which are not necessarily synced to your local machine. The status icons and availability column work here just as they do with OneDrive. Thumbnails are retrieved from the cloud without downloading the files, while double-clicking a file to load it into the viewer will download the full file automatically. As you can see, the status icon changes to indicate the file is now available on the local machine. The default tools menu now has options to open PowerShell in the current folder, next to the options to open Explorer or a normal command prompt. You can open a normal PowerShell window, or you can open an elevated one. Although it's not in the default toolbar, you can edit these buttons to make them open PowerShell's integrated scripting environment instead of the basic shell. If you've installed the Windows subsystem for Linux, a similar button can be made which opens a Linux shell in the current folder. You can also run Linux commands directly from the file display by first typing a pipe character. If you push the pipe key and then use the up and down cursor keys, you'll see a pop-up command history, as you do with other command types. The colours and keys which the command field uses can be changed in preferences. The command for copying file paths to the clipboard has a new WSL parameter which makes it copy the paths in the format which software on the Linux side expects. You can see the MNT or mount prefix at the start of all the paths. Opus also now understands this kind of path, and they work anywhere that aliases do already. Buttons have a new WSL script function type, and this allows them to run Linux commands directly and pass selected files to them, and so on. If you don't see this in the dropdown, you probably don't have WSL installed. This simple example sends the selected files to the Linux cat command, and pipes the output of that into the more command. If I edit the button to simply echo the file paths, you can see that Opus is automatically translating the selected file paths into the format which Linux expects. So now, if you're one of those people who love using Vi as a text editor, you can now do that from Opus. For Windows 10 only, we now have a new preferences page which makes it easy to change the Windows E hotkey. A lot of people are used to using this to open Explorer, 
but when they switch to Opus, they want to be able to configure which folders and tabs it opens. It's now easier to make the Windows E hotkey reactivate an existing window if there is one, instead of opening a new one. Or, if you don't want the hotkey to open Opus at all, you can revert it to opening Explorer. You can also make it open the default lister or a custom layout, or have it run an internal command, or you can make it run an external command. For the next part, I've turned on the option which opens externally launched folders in new tabs. If I make a folder on the desktop and then double click it, it opens in a new tab in the last window that I was using. If I now change to another virtual desktop and do the same, older versions would have switched back to the original desktop to activate that old window. The new version now avoids this and opens a new window on the current desktop, even though the double clicked folder is already open on the other one. This and other changes involving virtual desktops can be turned off if you preferred things how they were. When saving layouts for all listers, only the windows on the current virtual desktop are saved. And the option to close existing listers when opening the layout will now only close the windows that are on the current desktop, leaving the other desktops alone. So you can see this window open over here, and when I switch desktops and open a layout, that other window is left alone. But if I switch desktops and open the layout there, the window will be closed. Command switch tile windows now only affect the current desktop. So these four windows were tiled, filling the screen, but the two on the other desktop were left alone. Some commands which affect multiple windows have a new argument to restrict them to only the current virtual desktop. The commands which close and collapse other windows into the current one are examples of this. That's the end of part two. Thanks for watching again. Parts three and four are on the way.